is bestowed on Hyderabad a rich heritage and a distinct culture known as Dakni. Charminar come to symbolize Hyderabad for the rest of the world. Hyderabad is also famous for many historical monuments like the Kuli Kutub Shahi tombs, High Court, Osmania Hospital, Arts College, and the Legislative Assembly. This city of the Nawabs enjoyed a cosmopolitan and multi-religious atmosphere in its numerous grand mosques, elegant temples, exquisite churches, and ethereal gurdwaras. The kingdom of Golconda in the Deccan Plateau of South India was ruled by a dynasty known as Qutub Shahis. Muhammad Uli Qutub Shah was the ruler of the Qutub Shahi dynasty. This Muslim ruler was charmed by a Hindu maiden named Bhagmati. He married Bhagmati, renamed her as Hyderamal and built the city of Hyderabad to celebrate his love for her. Hyderabad, the only city in the world founded on love, is now being wedded to commerce. Focused on the IT industry, the traditional city of Hyderabad is getting transformed into the modern city of Cyberabad. Today, Hyderabad has a large number of multi-story buildings, world-class shopping malls, a variety of business establishments and commercial complexes. The scenic beauty, historical monuments and commercial promise of Hyderabad attract a large number of tourists and businessmen from all over the world who are hosted by hotels setting international standards. Special spaces are available for ethnic arts, crafts, and traditional foods. A large number of gardens, parks, and a variety of recreational facilities make life in Hyderabad enjoyable. In recent times, the city has also become very conscious of its look and image. To be clean and beautiful has become a passion with this metropolis. For two consecutive years, in 1998-99 and in 1999-2000, Hyderabad earned the distinction of being the cleanest city of India. But fate had its own designs on Hyderabad. On 24th August 2000, when Hyderabad woke up, it found itself in ruins.
The water came from the nala at the back. Houses and belongings were destroyed. Children suffered. We all suffered very much. The nala waters came up to the waist by 12 midnight and by 2 it submerged the entire area. Children, adults and all the residents of the locality left the place with only the clothes they were wearing. We could not take even a spoon. For two nights we took shelter at a complex. When we came back, all houses were washed away and nothing remained. When water started coming, she climbed onto the roof holding two sisters. They slipped and fell into the water and drowned. The door was closed. Later we found the bodies inside the room. Why was nature so furious? This uh, flood which was there unfortunately for the city, I feel it was man-made. It was neglect of man and a feeling that man can conquer nature. I think it is high time humanity understands one should live in companionship with nature but never fight the nature. In this quest for modernity, Hyderabad has forgotten its other history, a history of living in partnership with nature. A history of its lakes and unique artistic rock formations, of green reserves and natural forests. The city, which was founded on the banks of River Musi, was also famous for its wells, ponds, canals and lakes. The history taught us, irrespective of any religious or caste background, the erstwhile ruler's main prime objective was to provide a source for living, a source for drinking, a source for food. Kings of Kakatiya, Krishnadevaraya and Nawabs of Hyderabad, they contributed Major share in building small water resources, which is an alternate slogan all over the world today. Fox Sagar was originally known as Nakkala Cheruvu. The band was constructed in the year 1897 by the British to provide water to the cantonment. Located near Jirimatla on the outskirts of Hyderabad, the water from the lake flows into the Hussain Sagar. Miralam Lake, an architectural marvel, is the only one multi-arch dam of its kind in the world. Constructed in 1805, it used to be a source of drinking water till 1960. Osman Sagar was built on Musi River in 1920. This reservoir provides drinking water to the city of Hyderabad. Its catchment area is about 290 square miles. Himayat Sagar was built in 1926 on Isi, a tributary of Musi. It has a large catchment area of 505 square miles and was constructed along with Usman Sagar to check floods. Constructed by Hussein Shawali in the 15th century, Hussein Sagar Lake is situated in between the twin cities of Hyderabad and Sikandrabad. It provides a variety of recreational facilities to the people. This kunta or pond at Katedan is one of the many large and small kuntas that dotted the city of Hyderabad. And there were wells. In large numbers, 
known as baulis. Most of these wells had unique, exquisite construction for a variety of uses. This is how Hyderabad looked 70 years back. The blue areas represent water bodies. It is said that there were over 600 water bodies in and around Hyderabad. Many localities of Hyderabad are named after lakes, ponds, wells and gardens located in the area. A large number of these gardens and water bodies were named after their builders. Such contributions to society were appreciated by all. But unfortunately, things have changed. Over the years, a number of these water bodies have disappeared. A survey conducted in 1975 showed that only 169 lakes remained with greatly reduced area. Today, hardly 40 or 50 lakes still remain, but most of these will become extinct in the near future. The last decade has seen a spurt in the real estate business, which also unfortunately encouraged encroachments in the water bodies. The basic problem in this entire issue is we lack a comprehensive understanding of urban planning. This is all that remains of a large water body located in the heart of the city. This was known as the Masap tank. Over the years, this water body was systematically dried up and occupied. Now there is a garden, housing colonies, and also government offices located on the tank bed. Even water bodies on the outskirts of the city are not safe. This was a large water body known as Musa Pet Cheru, located a few kilometers outside Hyderabad. Now giving into houses and multi-storied complexes. Patel Kunta Park inaugurated by Sri N. Chandrababu Naidu, the Chief Minister of Andhra Pradesh, on 17 June 2000. This was yet another water body which is now converted into a park. Water bodies are also being converted into roads and recreation areas. Industries also play a major role in polluting and reducing water bodies. Adversely affecting life, disturbing the entire ecological balance. Hyderabad, nature has blessed us with a geographical and topographical situation where the water can drain off easily because of the hill ranges, the valleys, the lakes and so on. But we have interfered too much with them, with projects like Nandanvanam, which where we tried to channelize a mighty river like Musi, with projects like Hussain Sagar, where we encroached steadily on the river, but both private encroachers and by the government through various projects. This has resulted in what are basically water bodies being converted as real estate developments. We cannot mock nature. She will assert herself. Nature did assert itself and completely inundated many localities and colonies that had come up on what were lake beds. This is a colony of the middle class and the rich and is situated on what was a large water body known as Durgam Cheru. A number of such localities were under six to nine feet of water. Fortunately, there was not much damage to property or life. But all areas were not equally lucky. At least, not the areas of the poor. Hundreds of houses of the poor of Savdarnagar locality constructed on what was the bed of Maisamma Kunta Pond were totally submerged. But a large number of these houses 
were also destroyed, rendering hundreds homeless. This middle class colony was built on the remains of the Ramantapur Cheru. During the floods, it remained in the water for a very long time. Another water body encroached completely is at Hashmakpet. The inflow channels of this lake were blocked and the drying lake bed occupied. On the fateful day, with just a little more than normal rain, the water could not find any room at this lake. It gushed out through the Hashmat Pet Nala and caused havoc in the localities along its route. Maximum damage was caused at Rasulpura. When the band of Hasmatpet Lake breached, water rushed into our area and started damaging houses and property. Fortunately, the airport wall caved in and some water flowed away from that side too. Otherwise, all the 3,000 people living in the locality would have been killed. Now we have only clothes that we are wearing and all houses and belongings are washed away. Innocence of Rasulpura paid the price of the encroachments at Hashmat Pet. This is a typical example of people along the Nalas getting devastated because of the encroachment of lakes. After destroying Rasulpura, the waters gushed towards the Hussein Sagar. Similar thing happened along the Kukatpali Balanagar Nala. These waters also come into the Hussein Sagar. With these water bodies occupied, the rainwaters flowed out at ferocious pace, devastating areas all along the Nalas. Everything is lost. We don't have even clothes. For two days we stayed on the roof. Afterwards, we were rescued with the help of ropes tied to our face. The worst affected places were Bhavani Nagar, Prabhakar Reddy Nagar, Deen Dayal Nagar and Fateh Nagar. Living along the Nalas has its own dangers. Being extremely polluted, the Nalas pose a constant threat to health. There is also the danger of children and sometimes even adults falling into the waters and drowning. And there is always the threat of flash floods, which on that fateful day destroyed even the road. Before flowing into the Hussein Sagar. All lakes are interconnected by Nalas. Encroachment of one lake forces more water into the Nalas and lakes downstream receive excess water. Hussein Sagar receives its water from four main Nalas or water channels. Starting from northeast, these four Nalas are the Piket Nala, the Kukatpali Nala, the Sheikhpet or Banjara Hills Nala and the Balkapur Nala. These four Nalas send in over 93 million litres of water per day into the Hussein Sagar. This lake, we should understand, is older than Hyderabad. Hyderabad formed in 1691 and this is 1661, 30 years earlier to Hyderabad, by the Golconda kings. Since my attachment to Hussein Sagar is, be, is very, very natural, because this is the second largest freshwater lake in India. First lake, most of us know, is also in Bhopal. 
in the capital of a state. This is an excellent place where one can think of fresh water, spend beautiful time in the evenings. You don't get such occasions and such blessings of nature anywhere else in this country. The original area of the lake was 1,664 hectares with a surface area of over 10 square kilometers. The total catchment area was about 320 square kilometers. Over the years, the area of the lake has reduced to only about 350 hectares. Thousands of birds used to flock to the Hussein Sagar. Now you hardly see any birds. This is due to pollution and steady encroachments of the Hussein Sagar Lake. Poor, middle class and the elite all have occupied the Hussein Sagar Lake bed. Complexes, memorials, parks and roads. These projects of the government further deplete the area of the lake. There is also a sewerage treatment plant constructed right on the lake bed. During the annual Ganesh festival, thousands of Ganesh idols are immersed in the lake every year, causing pollution due to materials used and silting. This board, claiming ownership of the land, is standing on the Hussein Sagar lake bed. Due to all such encroachments, the area of the lake is already reduced by over 40%. 24 centimeters of rain in 18 hours is not a very heavy rainfall. But Hyderabad was cornered and appeared vulnerable. The capacity of Hussein Sagar because of the roads that have been laid on three sides, the capacity has been reduced probably by at least 40 percent. Whereas, because of urbanization of the catchment, the catchment is about 98 square miles, which has several feeders also leading into the lake. Because of the urbanization, the absorption, absorption capacity of the catchment has been reduced. Only 30 percent of the water normally flows into a tank with such a uh, catchment, you see, as Hussain Sagar has been having. But now, because of laying up roads, building up houses, the flow into the lake has increased, you see, to about 80%. That means more than double what was uh, entering the lake, you see, before. As a result, there will be overflow every few years. All the Nalas discharging water into this lake did overflow on that day. With siltation and reduced area, Hussein Sagar could not take the waters and sluice gates had to be opened. All together and without sufficient warning to the people downstream. The speeding waters left behind tales of destruction, destitution and death. అంత ఎక్కువ రాలేదు ఇది వరకు ఆ నమ్మకం తోటి మేము ఏం చేసినాం అంటే ఇంకా నీళ్లు రావ అనుకొని అప్పటి దాకా ఇంట్లోనే ఉన్నాము అప్పటికి ఒకటి నర అయింది ఇంట్లో దాకా నీళ్ళ బాకీల దాకా నీళ్ళు వచ్చింది ఇంకా చూద్దాం ఇంకా తగ్గితలే తగ్గితలే అనుకొని ఊరుకున్నాం ఊరుకున్న తర్వాత ఇంత ఎంత ఎంత లోపలికి ఇంట్లోకి వచ్చేసినాయి ఇంట్లోకి వచ్చిన తర్వాత ఏం చేస్తాము అర్థం అవట్లేదు ఆ రేకులు బావులు కొట్టుకొని పైకి వెళ్ళిపోతున్నాం ఇక we broke our asbestos roots and climbed on the top. There was no sleep, only fear. We were afraid about our old people and children. One after the other, all the houses started collapsing around us. Helicopters came and rescued some of us. Everything was destroyed in one night. We were just standing helplessly.
People are providing relief, but they can help us only for a few days. We can't think. We don't know how to think. We don't know where we will live and how our lives will go on. Papers and other documents so essential for urban life were washed away or damaged. All our property documents are damaged. We had registered our house after paying 25,000 rupees. How can we sell it without papers? Will the government find some solution to this? We are unable to understand anything. Not just papers and property, but precious lives were also washed away by the crushing waters. The waters broke the front door, rushed into the house and washed away my daughter through the back door and into the Nala. She was 17 years old, studying in inter first year. Her name was Shahina. The most vulnerable are women and children. With damage to books, schooling is also affected. Some children are forced to drop out and join the labor force. The less said about the old, the better. I didn't get any money. Officer, said, we gave it to your daughter already. We cannot give you again. My daughter also has two small children. She is not willing to feed me. Where can I go at this age? How do I live? The handicapped and single women have their own sorrows. We lost everything. We are living on the road. We are sleeping outside in the open, even when it rains. I have two children. I delivered my second child just 10 days back. My husband deserted me. I don't know where he is. Nobody is helping us. I am begging to feed my children. But life has to go on. Even among ruins, life has to go on. One has to search for and gather food, cook, eat whatever one could manage, eat wherever one could find place and pick up dreams of a new life from the ruins. We cannot leave them to rebuild their lives on their own. They need support from the government, NGOs and people. Victims of such calamities have different experiences about the relief they get. In the middle of the night, police came and shifted us to a marriage hall. The officials fed us for four days. On the fifth day, they gave us 20 kg of rice and 500 rupees. Nothing happened to those living in buildings, but they are getting money from the government. We, the people living in the huts, are not getting anything. 
officials are getting angry with us because we are questioning them. They are sending us from one office to another. Don't they have sense? How is it that budget always gets over by the time our turn comes? Everywhere there seems to be more of chaos and less of relief. The government, the NGOs, all the people, none seem to have any contingency plans for such calamities. The manner in which most relief operations are organized further dehumanize the victims. We had uh, reacted to an uh, emergency situation. And what I feel is that uh, one should not react to the point of panic. One should go assess the situation, uh, see what the actual needs of the people are, and then help the people to help themselves. Most relief operations revolve only around providing food and clothes. But most people have also lost their homes. And an immediate need would also be that of some shelter. Some people who are victims of such calamities are perceived as encroachers and are under pressure to move out to be resettled. But most want to stay on in the same area. We don't want to move from this place. Recently we sold our village property and purchased this house for two and a half lakh rupees. Only one room remains, but we want to stay only here. Floods that recently happened was due to encroachment of the water bodies in the city of Hyderabad and Secunderabad. In the ten cities in Hyderabad and uh, Rangarati districts. But the encroachment, the blame for the encroachment now being, is being put by the government on the poor. Our assessment is that it is the uh, government and the real estate, the well-to-do, the builders who are the main encroachers of these water bodies, while the poor form only between 10 to 15 percent of the encroachment. Uh, for instance, on the Hussein Sagar Nala, that has become the major talking point as far as evictions are concerned, there are 18 slums that are located on this Nala, which cover about 10 percent of the total uh, encroachment areas along the Nala. But then the government the task force that has been appointed is first targeting or uh, seem to target the slums that are located. Most of these poor who are treated as encroachers by the rest of the society either have patra for the lands given to them by the government or have purchased the plots from some land dealer. Most are living in the same place for years and have invested the entire savings of their hard and honest lives to slowly build their simple dwellings. I am living in this locality for the last 40 years. First I had a hut, then slowly I constructed a house. I came here as a bride and raised my entire family here. Our livelihood is only here. If you relocate us elsewhere, how will we survive? People who move to resettlement colonies constructed outside the city continue to face a number of problems. We came here, but we are facing many problems. There is no water, there is no electricity. Only one board is working and people constantly fight for water. We have to go for work to Chadargan and it costs us minimum 10 rupees for the fares. While some people were allotted houses, others are still living in dormitories. Many families in a single hall, without walls, without privacy, carrying out all the life's activities in subhuman conditions.
what we refer as slums, the people in the slums, we have failed to recognize them and give them a social status as the service sector. We have failed to understand the dynamic relationship between this strata of urban society with other middle class, upper middle class and rich society. There is a greater need to look into the town plan policies. We need to provide adequate space for the service sector at every residential colony unless and until we review this we may not be able to find a proper solution to the urban plan history acknowledges hyderabad as a well-planned city the fast-paced development of hyderabad violating basic principles of urban planning is leading to serious ecological imbalances one well, of the problems which the twin cities of Hyderabad and Secunderabad faced recently in the floods and have continued to face in other contexts earlier could have been avoided if the notified master plan of the Huda had been scrupulously followed. Deviations were made, green areas were converted into residential or commercial areas and industrial areas came up where they should not have and the master plan became a kind of a dead letter. Lakes are deliberately dried up by blocking the inflow channels and filled with earth. In case of green areas, the task of encroachment becomes much easier. Water and trees are forced to give way to roads and buildings. This used to be a lake named Erra Kunta. Now, there are roads, buildings, and all that remains of the lake. Apart from violations of the master plan, another problem is that of ill-advised projects like the Nandanavanam. This project, intended to channelize the mighty river Musi through a small channel, thinking that this river will never flow again. The Nandan Vanam project plans to resettle hundreds of families living on the banks of the river for decades, reclaim the riverbed and use it for construction of roads, recreation centers and commercial establishment. After a gap of 10 years, the river was flooded in 1998 and again in 2000. The channel on which crores of rupees were spent was totally submerged. If all the structures proposed in the Nandanvanam project are constructed, and if any waters again flow down the Musi in future, as it happened twice in the last three years, all these structures would be washed away. The obstructions they would cause could lead to the flooding of large areas of Hyderabad all along the river. I am surprised to know that a project has been conceived and has been taken up for execution with the title of Nandavanam project and a central drain has also been built. It must have cost several crores of rupees but I find that the sea is already silted up. The purpose of this project and how it has been planned or designed is not very clear. Probably Nandavanam project requires a thorough re-examination before anything is done about it. It is true that there can be many ill-conceived projects and there will be violations of the master plan. It is also true that water bodies and green areas are occupied by all sections of society. By the poor, the middle class, the rich, and even by business establishments and industries. The government which should protect green areas and water bodies and ensure the implementation of the master plan is not far behind in effecting or legitimizing deviations.
who should be the guardian the protector who should take responsibility constitution of india defines protection of environment our natural landscapes and so on as not only a direct principle of state policy but also as a fundamental duty of every citizen when we look at the urban landscape we realize it is not only the mistakes of the state government but also the mistakes and follies of citizens who flock to the cities in search of jobs and are prepared to cut corners compromise in choosing their buildings where the builders violate norms and the citizens go along with them where they choose to have areas which are really to be earmarked as wilderness so they choose to go for walking there instead of trying to improve neighborhood parks everywhere having more playgrounds instead of putting building buildings everywhere the citizens should rise in protest if any of these things are violated instead of being part of the whole effort to make the city unsustainable ecological protection and sustainable development should be a collective responsibility government industry business activists citizens all sections of society must be involved in evolving and ensuring the implementation of a master plan to rebuild the city along new and sustainable directions of growth a master plan that would give back the rightful places to trees what a body and plan for adequate space and provisions for all of fellow creatures a master plan that would save hyderabad from becoming a city of destruction and make it a city of deliverance of nirvana 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 nirvana